Hello, with me today I have Matthew McEachern, Senior Research Analyst in the Retail Sector at Singer Capital Markets. You've just produced a 60-page report study in the UK consumer sector, key investment themes and recommendations. Could you give a summary of what's been happening in the sector recently? What's the mood? Yeah, it's a good question. The sector has suffered from a sequence of negative events really since the start of the pandemic, all the way through to very recently being the cost of living crisis. And consumer confidence has taken a real hit. Um, and the focus of our note is really looking at what the moving parts are behind consumer confidence. And we conclude that there are a number of things there which are gonna to contribute towards a, an improvement, a recovery uh, in consumer confidence over the course of the next six to nine months. And you know, it, not necessarily back to levels that predate COVID, but nonetheless a recovery. And with the real incomes starting to recover, we believe that consumer confidence can translate into a slight improvement in spending on the demand side. Okay. Well, look, it's, it's a sector where many stocks have struggled for the past uh, couple of years, especially some of the online uh, closed retailers. Everything was going so well. I mean, what's been behind the downturn? Well, yeah. So during the start of the pandemic, when restrictions were in place, lockdown restrictions, thank goodness a, a long and distant memory, you know, a lot of those online retailers saw a massive surge in demand. And that surge in demand then rolled over. And I think what really caught people by surprise during the course of 2023, well, really since the end of 2022, was how much share the multi-channel retailers captured back. Um, and to this point, online retail sales over the course of this current year to date have been negative. And there was an expectation there would be a bounce back to some positive trend. And I think that you know, the online guys have had to have a bit of a strategic reset, partly the end of free money, uh, partly, you know, increased competitiveness amongst the multi-channel retailers after they had their tough time during lockdown. And as a result, they've, they've just not been able to chase revenue or customer recruitment to the same level as they would ordinarily have liked to. Um, so, so that's contributed to their lack of revenue growth, if you like. But there is a strategic reset that's happening across the subsector and a lot of them are going to be in a better place, you know, for the start of next year, potentially. OK, you, you talk about when you mention multi-channel retailers, you mean some of the, the bricks and mortar uh, retailers like Next and those? Kind yes, of that's right. So multi-channel, what, what that means is that's retailers that have got their original store base. They've also got you know, an online channel. They're really starting to join the dots up in terms of making those channels work together to provide a better, more convenient proposition to the consumer. And, you know, during this, particularly during the cost of living crisis where customers have been, you, you, you know, really t being very careful with their spending, I think they've been out frequenting shops a bit more, looking for value rather than searching online, maybe paying for, you know, delivery charges and such like. So. The multi-channel retailers this year have been outperforming online compared to the online pure plays. And I think that's, that looks sustainable to some degree, but I think the online guys are going to start getting competitive at some point. Uh, look, the, the range of retail stocks that you and other singer, singer analysts cover is quite broad. Um, are there some areas of the retail sector that have done better than others? And could you explain why? I mean, you've talked about multi-channel um, just now, but yeah. within the the sector as a whole? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's quite a broad, broad question to answer. But if we go back to the end of 2022, so just under a year ago, valuations in the sector, including some of the online retailers, had got very, very low, unsustainably low. And because the news flow in terms of retail sales and some of the individual companies didn't deteriorate any further, actually, as the news flow came through, so there was some recovery. So there have been a number of online retailers that have bounced quite significantly from very, very low levels, as well as some of the multi-channel retailers. Um, I think as we look forward from here, it is again going to be a mixture of performance. But you know, what our, our analysis looking at consumer confidence and why that might lead to demand improvement, it, it, it's not a case of a rising tide is gonna float all boats. You know, there are consumer groups relating to mortgages or younger households, which are still feeling quite a lot of pressure, or you know, if you've got a mortgage, an increasing amount of pressure. Whereas older consumers, those with savings, are starting to generate more income as interest rates have risen. So between that, uh, some of the thematic trends that we've been looking at, and balance sheets, you know, exposure to debt, 
you can see why some businesses are still going to face some pressures, but others you know, could potentially be beneficiaries and start overperforming. Okay. Um, so you're optimistic about the, the future. You said mixed. Um, again, I'm asking sort of what events, themes or behaviours are likely to trigger an upturn in fortunes. Now, you've, you've sort of mentioned that there are likely to be mixed fortunes, but are there sort of going to be drive? Give me something. Give me some good news. What's going to happen? Yeah. Well, if our view is right, the consumer confidence starts rebuilding a little bit from here. And given what I've said about, you know, there are savers who are benefiting very significantly and there's a lag in terms of the pain on mortgages, there may be a little bit more spending power as we go into this all important fourth quarter. You know, it's, gold, it's called the golden quarter. And, you know, there's a lot of consumer spending which takes place. <clears throat> it's partly seasonal, it's partly the run into Christmas. You've got the Black Friday events. It's a really important period. So what I'm going to be looking for is, you know, on balance, hopefully some overperformance in terms of the, the sales forecasts in certain of these retailers and that translating through operational gearing into some upgrades, particularly given consensus estimates in a lot of stocks have been really pared back and are quite prudent. So we'll be looking for, for news flow on outperformance on the, on the sales side, translating into earnings upgrades potentially in some stocks. Okay. Well, I mean, inflation and the cost of living crisis has worked against a lot of consumers, but equally there have been significant wage increases, certainly in the private sector, yeah. and now we're seeing wage increases in the public sector too. Yeah. So how much of an impact is that having and will that have if wages do keep up with inflation in the, in, in the years ahead? This is really important. I mean, this is the crux of it. CPI has been rolling over. Wages, you know, did increase. They've been lagged, you know, in particular the national living wage only increased in April. And we are now at a point, and I know it may not feel like it for many households and consumers, but we are now at a point where, you know, we're seeing real, real income growth again. And, you know, there's a... Um, there's a body called, uh, well, ASDA produces an income um, tracker, which uh, monthly reports on the amount of discretionary spend that your average household is left with after all your fixed costs have gone out the door. And, you know, that was severely under pressure. And, you know, the start of this year was 20% was down, you know, year on year. Um, it's been recovering through the course of this year and is now tracking into positive territory again. And that's, that's quite an important place to be. And again, it's not all households, but on average, that's where we're at. And normally, that is a lead indicator in terms of how spending will, 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 will follow, including just a slight improvement in discretionary spending as that power increases. OK, right. Well, look, we've talked about not all companies uh, are, are going to do well. It's going to be a mixed um, performance, a mixed outlook. So if I'm an investor and I want to put some money into... Uh, the retail sector, and you've, you've mentioned valuations were were low, and I suspect the valuations in some parts of the sector are still relatively low. But if I'm an investor and I want to put money into the sector, what what sort of variables, what metrics should I be looking at as, as indicators that a particular company is a good investment right now? Yeah, so um, we've we've run a screening tool which tries to look at, you know, is a business exposed to these positive trends in terms of, you know, maybe slightly older consumers where they're benefiting from you know, deposits and higher interest rates, as opposed to those with mortgages. Um, we're looking at ones which maybe have less exposure to, um, you know, housing transactions or interest-free credit, big ticket discretionary items, because there's still some pressures there. And we're looking at ones with strong balance sheets and also ones with significant amounts of self-help. And, you know, that, that's allowed, I mean, that is a good screen to try and work out which businesses are, are likely well disposed to this improving um, consumer confidence trend. Um, by contrast, you know, if you've got heavy exposure to big ticket, um, to younger consumers with mortgages, um, and you know, you're indebted, and there's not a lot of self-help, you know, arguably the risks are potentially still increasing. Um, and in terms of valuations, it's a good question. You know, we believe that you know, on a simple PE metric, the valuations in the sector are around about 25% below their historic averages and on forecasts which are quite prudent. So I think, um, you know, single digit PEs, you know, there's plenty of them around. That's a good place to start. And, you know, looking at EV EBITDA multiples, there are some which are as low as one times, you know. So, so I think if you can screen out those names using, using that screening tool 
and then find ones which are on single digit PEs or very low single digit EV EBITDA multiples, which have got net cash, then I think that's a pretty good place to start. Matthew McEachern at Singer Capital Markets, thanks very much for joining me today. Absolutely my pleasure. Nice to see you.